Yeah, so I'll just start with uh, a very good morning to everyone in US and a good evening to the audience watching uh, the webinar live from India and the other parts of the world. I am Aman Hans, a current student of Columbia Business School pursuing my MBA and previously part of Niti IO Government of India. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the first session of the day two of the India Business Conference. And the topic is India's leap towards clean energy. This is an extremely critical topic for India, considering it being one signatory to the Paris Accord and the fact that 14 of the 20 most polluted cities in the world are in India as per the World Bank survey. So we have an exciting panel for you all to offer the depth and insight into the, this intriguing topic. Mr. Suman Sinha, Chairman and Managing Director of Renew Power, which is India's largest clean energy generation company. He's also an alumnus of Columbia University where he pursued the prestigious SIPA program. So we are just waiting for him. Um, so before I welcome uh, uh, him, uh, we also have Ms. Akshima Ghate, uh, Principal Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a leading US-based think tank working towards clean energy transition with government stakeholders across the world. Akshima is a close friend and is also Delhi-based principal in RMI's India program. She provides leadership to RMI's ongoing initiative with various government agencies in India, including Niti Aayog, with a focus on clean mobility and advanced battery storage. Welcome, Akshima. Both the panelists shall be in conversation with Professor Bruce Usher, who is the faculty director Tema Institute of Social Enterprise at Columbia Business School, where he teaches on the intersection of finance, social and environmental issues. Welcome, Professor. Yeah. <clears throat> so without taking much of your time, I invite Professor Usher and the panelists for the deliberation. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Aman. Uh, thanks for the kind invitation to join you here this morning or this evening in, uh, in India. And uh, Akshima, nice to nice to meet you by, uh, by video. Um, why don't we start? I know Akshima, you've done some very interesting work at uh, RMI on uh, electric vehicles, electric vehicle mobility. And uh, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, why electric vehicle mobility is is critical to uh, the future of India, a clean future for India, and uh, especially uh, not just automobiles but buses as well and other forms of transit. Perhaps we could start there. Sure. Thanks, Professor Asher. It's so nice to meet you. Um, thanks, Aman. And also thanks uh, to Columbia Business School and the organizers uh, for putting together this conference and inviting me to share my thoughts. Um, just to reflect on uh, what you said, Professor Asher, about you know, the criticality of the EV transition uh, for India uh, in terms of you know, driving the clean energy future for the country. I just want to begin with some numbers. So just to set the context, you know, why EVs are really important. Professor, the numbers are good, more numbers, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and I love numbers, just to kind of orient everyone and to highlight the magnitude of the challenge that really we have. So, I mean, we're talking about you know, energy consumption. I think most of us know that India is the third largest primary energy you know, consumer in the world. We're talking about 35 exajoules of energy being consumed, third largest consumer. But the reality is that the per capita energy consumption so far is pretty low when we compare to the rest of the world. And uh, if you're talking about the energy basket for the country, uh, almost uh, you know, one third of our energy needs are being, made, uh, being met by oil and oil products. Most, a lot of it, I would, you know, uh, about 60% of which is going actually to the transportation sector. Now, why should this concern us? Uh, essentially, because India doesn't have oil. Right. We are producing, uh, you know, importing 90% uh, of our uh, oil requirements, just to share some numbers, you know, we um, consumed about 260, uh, you know, million tons of oil last year, and we imported 90% of it. And this translated into a budgetary, you know, expenditure of 8 lakh crores, which is about 112 billion US dollars. Um, and we just had our budget being announced, and we are expecting an expenditure of 430 billion US dollars. So one fourth of our budgetary expenditure is actually going just on, um, you know, 
importing oil. I think that's a big, big flag, a critical flag for the country if you're talking about an energy secure future. Talking more about clean, why really an oil dependent or I would say an almost 100% dependence on oil for transportation, not good for India. Um, you, know, uh, you know, when we're talking about clean, uh, Aman just mentioned uh, you know, 15 cities. If you were to pick 30 most polluted cities in the world, 21 happen to be in India. Uh, I happen to be <laughs> right now uh, be in a city which has the dubious distinction of being the most polluted city in the world. Not something, uh, you know, one should be proud of. Uh, uh, nobody is proud of this, uh, you know, fact. And, uh, you know, and this is something, you know, while a lot of us are paying attention to, of course, the COVID crisis, it's you know, a crisis uh, which uh, needs so much of budgetary expenditure, etc., for the countries. The whole air pollution story is really a public uh, health crisis, which has been really silent in making. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, really talking about uh, in the most polluted cities of the you know in the country, ten years of uh, life expectancy being reduced. Uh -huh. One in you know four in ten uh, children in um, Delhi is found to have respiratory ailments. So this is really the challenge when we are talking about clean and why this over dependence on oil is really not good, especially when we are seeing such a growth of uh, vehicles. Talking about greenhouse gas emissions, BNEF analysis is showing that uh, India is the only country uh, that will actually double its emissions, carbon dioxide emissions from the transportation sector over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, you know, that, that's it. And the next one being China. So these are trends that are really worrying. And so if you're really, you know, talking about a clean future, and I would really call it a clean and secure energy future, the this future has to be low oil dependent. We cannot be dependent on oil the way we are for transportation sector. And that's really where I would put the picture of EVs. EVs right now are giving us that opportunity to reduce uh, this uh, dependence on oil significantly um, globally. And we can talk more about that, the trends in you know, reduction in battery prices, uh, the improvement in battery technology are really driving the whole EV revolution along with innovation in business models, financing. And that's something that gives us a hope and confidence that EVs are really critical for the clean energy future uh, that we're talking about. And also one last point that I want to highlight in that uh, context is that also the second life of batteries that EVs demand is going to create is further going to fuel or support uh, even the RE transition that we're talking about uh, for the That's country. Right. This is for energy storage. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for getting us started. And uh, as you point out, there's, there's environmental reasons, uh, climate change, but as you also pointed out, economic and geopolitical reasons for this transition. So there's a lot of a lot of trends, a lot of drivers. I see that our uh, other panelists here, Sumit Sinha, has, has been able to join us. And Sumit, uh, good evening in, in India. Good morning here in New York City. Nice to uh, nice to have you uh, with us. Um, perhaps we can uh, uh, move over to Sumant to uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, the, renew the renewable energy sector in India, and perhaps uh, you could frame that in the context of the extraordinary growth in renewable power and uh, your sort of journey to uh, becoming a leader in the sector in India. Um, yeah, sure. Look, uh, uh, thanks a lot so much, uh, Bruce, for that. And thank you uh, to Columbia for inviting me for this uh, session. Uh, you know, the whole renewable energy um, industry or uh, sector in India is, uh, and in fact, the power sector in general is going through a massive transformation right now. And it's actually a transition from fossil fuels into clean energy. Yeah. And, um, and that's a transition that is well upon us right now. It's of course happening not just in India, but everywhere else in the world. But the scale of the transition is something I think that most people have not really yet been able to fully understand. Uh, and the reason it's being driven is uh, the fact that obviously till a couple of years ago, um, you know, renewables was a, was a so-called good thing to do because it was, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, less carbon intensive and in the context of uh, climate change issues, you know, people felt that renewable energy needed to be encouraged uh, and, and pushed and propagated. Mm. And so therefore different governments are finding different ways of doing that through either subsidies or, or renewable purchase standards and things like that. Now what's happened over the last couple of years is actually a, a absolute sea change. And that's really been driven by technology evolution. And what, is, what we are now witnessing is the fact that uh, renewable energy is fundamentally, uh, you know, significantly cheaper than coal-based power. 
or any other alternative source of power and that therefore is driving a massive change in how people are thinking about the power sector or the electricity sector in the future and um, as we look at the future in fact you will find and in a country like india specifically uh, the expectation is that india's power demand will grow at about 5 to 6% every year mm-hmm. which means that we'll actually double our power demand in the next 12 to 14 years right right now of the current 1.4 trillion units of power that we currently consume two thirds of that comes from renewable energy source uh, from coal based sources right but the expectation is that on the next 1.4 trillion units which by the way is the third largest sort of by itself market in the world right now in the next 1.4 trillion units two thirds of that will come from renewable energy sources and so that's going to be a very fundamental shift in how we generate power and of course it will come you know it will it will be accompanied by a number of challenges the first biggest challenge is execution on the ground yeah. the second is around intermittency management because obviously renewables is not base load power and you know it's not dispatchable to that extent so the management of that power from a intermittency standpoint is going to be very important but fundamentally the cheapness of renewable energy i mean today solar power is about 40% the price of coal based power and wind is about 50% the price of coal based power and those del- those differences on the delta are so significant now that even if you include storage costs uh, whether it's in the form of battery or anything else you know there's enough room for that to come in you know make uh, renewables more sort of easy to a- implement or in- incorporate into the grid and and yet have uh, capacity left over for uh, you know in being cheaper than uh, coal so therefore there is this this transition that we are looking at right now and today you know grids are not designed for that grids are designed for accepting large coal based power plants now we're going to have to re- redesign grids for accepting renewable energy and uh, and and different countries are going to move at different pace on that front uh, so i think this whole issue of uh, decarbonization of electricity is now well nigh upon us and it's it's actually going to be revolutionary in the at the pace at which it's going to play out but there's a second very big transformation and transition that is happening as well and that is the issue of um deepening electrification and what i mean by that is that today energy accounts for three fourths of carbon emissions but electricity within that accounts for only a third of the total energy consumption and so in a sense therefore electricity accounts for a quarter of global carbon emissions right now we will see that percentage of electricity in the energy mix beginning to increase yeah. as we have electric vehicles coming in as we have things like green hydrogen coming in you know and that to me is as critical a transformation as is just decarbonizing electrification so therefore uh, deepening electrification and decarbonization of the electricity value chain itself i think those are going to be two very big uh, trends in the future that are essentially going to mean that we are you know hopefully going to look at a less carbon intensive future Absolutely, absolutely. And the trends we're seeing in India are being reflected in other countries as well, but I think at a greater scale in India, it's happening faster in many ways. So you touched on two topics I want to dig into. First, with Akshima on the intermittency challenge and storage, and I'd let, you know I'd like to get to Akshima's insights on uh, what you're seeing the cost of batteries and the use of energy storage in in, in India. And then Samantha, I'd like to get your thoughts on on green hydrogen because this is a very interesting, very early stage. I I call this an on the horizon technology because it's it's not you know it's not commercial yet it's still it's still expensive. I'd be cu- curious to see how you think it fits in India but actually Mike tell us your thoughts on on price of storage and then the use of storage and maybe and then vehicle to grid storage as well. Right. right. Yeah. No, I think that's a very important now issue and topic that we need to address especially you know as india is setting more ambitious targets for itself as you know as far as renewables is concerned we're talking about 450 gigawatt by 2030 now and the questions of intermittency and successful integration they're going to become as mr sin also said earlier you know more and more critical and even now the fact that almost 80% of our renewable capacity is concentrated in just six i would say state geographies it means that the question of uh, bre integration is already being currently felt uh, at at least the level of these states 
it will require a suite of approaches, uh, you know, from better forecasting, thermal back down to geographical balancing. But as the need to balance higher and higher amount of RE is increasing, uh, the inevitability of, you know, economical storage options uh, is also, you know, emerging. Uh, of course, you know, batteries currently are not the most uh, economical option, but with price decline expectations and the fact that uh, battery storage can provide additional value stream um, for, uh, from simply grid storage to value of battery energy storage, it's going to become, you know, inevitably it will emerge uh, with time. We're already seeing this happening in some of our work that we are doing with uh, some discoms in some states. Uh, for example, we're working on long-term power <clears throat> procurement uh, planning in uh, one of the states uh, which is Rajasthan. We're working on demand fle uh, flexibility in Haryana, where we're seeing the value of batteries emerging for VRE integration, as well as providing grid balancing and demand flexibility, even in like less RE rich states. I think what we are seeing, and Aman mentioned about some of the work we've done in the past, and he's been a partner in some of that work. We were kind of, you know, estimating uh, the demand uh, for battery storage uh, in the country. We are talking about a cumulative demand of, you know, up to say a 750 gigawatt hour by 2030. A lot of it will be fueled by EVs. Uh, we're talking again in the context of EV, say one, uh, 110 in, uh, gigawatt hour. A lot of this capacity also, you know, uh, gets start getting released, you know, in terms of second life of batteries, which could then be used uh, for uh, battery storage. So overall, I would say that, uh, you know, while currently it is not an economical option, slowly and slowly we will see, you know, uh, it, it, it's used becoming prevalent. So there is definitely an opportunity at hand. We're seeing a lot of support action by government, also by MFIs like uh, World Bank and the you know ADB so of the world, which are really providing the uh, financial and the technical offerings for utilities to start experimenting, setting up pilots uh, and moving forward on that. So that's the current state of affairs. Yeah. There's a question from, uh, from someone in the audience who's, who's asking about other forms of energy storage. So my taking his question, summarizing from my perspective, you, is is all the battery storage or most of the battery storage coming uh, lithium ion, or do you see other forms? You see flow batteries. He's asking us a question of flywheel energy storage, which of course isn't for transportation, but maybe for stationary storage or more, more pumped hydro. Where, where are, are what is the likely storage solution for the future? So so far, what we see, you know, uh, I mean, of course, battery storage. I would say is not uh, so much at a scale that one can see and predict what will be the likely, you know, uh, solutions which will take like a more uh, large scale form. So far, whatever we've seen in terms of impetus by the government, it's definitely on uh, ACC, advanced chemistry cell battery, you know, uh, chemistries. So my, my kind of expectation would be that it will lean right in, in the beginning uh, towards more, uh, more of ACC chemistries, lithium ion chemistries, because we'll see a lot of its use manufacturing capacity being built also on that side though you know to begin with they may, would not definitely be economical yeah yeah Samantha and your uh, renewable powers uh, solar and wind projects have you been incorporating storage already to date is that something uh, already been done or is that in more still uh, to come well you know so far we've not been incorporating uh, batteries because we've not been required to mm -hmm. but you know last year we won a couple of very interesting tenders which required us to install, uh, which required us in the future to install uh, batteries. And so we've actually won capacity for about 300 megawatt hours of storage solutions that have to be installed by us over the next 12 to 18 months. And these are in fact gonna be the first uh, large utility scale uh, storage projects that are gonna be set up in India. Um, and so, you know, it's gonna be very interesting to see how that pans out. We're currently in discussion with all the global um, you know, battery OEMs uh, to see which are the better battery technologies for us to go with. And I guess over the next few months, we'll take a call on which ones you want to go with. But frankly speaking, so far, you know, we haven't really had large scale installations of batteries, but I presume it'll happen, um, you know, as we go forward over the next, uh, you know, maybe a year to two years. Uh, today, the reason batteries are not so predominant or, or so prevalent is because they're still expensive. Okay. And so using any batteries, yeah. you know, uh, just adds to cost dramatically. But we all know that costs in batteries are gonna come down uh, quite significantly as has happened in the case of solar modules as well, uh, that cost of batteries will come down substantially over the next uh, few years. 
And so my feeling is that, uh, you know, give it another three, four years and you'll find that uh, renewables plus storage uh, with fully dispatchable power, um, fully comparable to coal will become a lot cheaper yep. uh, than coal based power. Yep. And at that point in time, there will be absolutely no re reason to add any more coal based power into the grid. New coal based power, of course, the existing projects are a different matter. And then as you start having uh, uh, retirements of coal based plants, you'll start being, you know, you'll start seeing those getting replaced by by uh, renewables and storage as well. So from that standpoint, you know, um, uh, Akshima talked about a 450 gigawatt target that the government of India has set. Um, frankly, there is no reason why that can't actually be exceeded from a pure market standpoint. The reason it won't be exceeded, however, unfortunately, is because of execution issues. Yeah, and tell, tell us more about those. Yeah, yeah, here in the US, the same challenge. It's the on the ground execution issues are the big barriers. But tell us more of the, the situation you're finding, Samant. What, what are those execution challenges for, for you? Yeah, well, you know, there are there are several different types of challenges. One, of course, is the typical issue of uh, land acquisition, connectivity into the grid, getting local approvals, you know, all of that physical stuff, getting getting uh, equipment to the sites, getting enough people trained and, and uh, so on. So those are sort of the prosaic challenges that people, you know, sometimes don't talk about. Yeah. But those are very real issues. And if you ask me, honestly speaking, that is going to be the constraining factor to growth of renewables going forward. Yeah. So that's one set of challenges. The second set of challenges really is around grid management, because mm. you will have a situation where suddenly renewables will spike up. You know, for example, in India, renewables, wind, for example, uh, the bulk of wind energy is generated in the in the monsoon months, and that's also coincidentally when where demand tends to fall, and so you suddenly have demand falling, hydro picks up, wind picks up. And suddenly you have this big oh, mismatch. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you can't store for you can't store the energy for you know for like weeks at a time. It, that's just simply too expensive, right? So you have those kinds of limiting limiting uh, factors. Uh, and and solar, you know, how much solar can you pump into the grid? Because in the middle of the day, you know, if you have two hundred thousand megawatts of solar, that's equal to India's peak demand. Yeah. What happens to everything else at that time? You can't yeah. just dial everything else down, right? Yeah. So those are very fundamental, simple factors that. Uh, we have to find ways of getting around. And I'm sure we will, but that is therefore going to constrain growth as well. So that's the second reason. And the third issue is really the fact that in India, the distribution utilities are in very poor financial health. Mm. And therefore, you know, they need to really be set right. And that's one unfinished reform agenda of India. The government is trying very hard to find solutions, but unfortunately this is sitting in the hands of state governments of India. Uh, and India being a federal country, unfortunately, the central government has only so much say over the state governments. And the state governments, frankly speaking, couldn't care less about climate change. I mean, it's a provocative statement, of course, but they certainly have a much less higher, you know, much less sensitivity towards uh, these kinds of issues than the central government has. And they can just say, you know, carbon intensity, carbon emissions, and so on. Beyond the point, you know, I, I just care about bringing the cheapest power to my people and, uh, you know, don't bother me with all these other issues. So I think discom reforms uh, is is the other big, big uh, constraining factor. Right, right. And politically, that could be a big challenge. It's, uh, it's tough. It's tough. So, you, you you know, none of the issues you mentioned with growth and renewables and intermittency and, and the grid, many of these could be solved with green hydrogen, right? This is a interesting solution, but as we talked about just a minute ago, it's it's not quite commercial, there's infrastructure challenges. So what, what are your thoughts about the future of green hydrogen in, in India and how, how, might that, how might that move forward? And I realize this is, you know, hard to say at this point, uh, but it's yeah. exciting. No, look, I, I think, Bruce, that green hydrogen is probably five to 10 years out at the very earliest. Yeah. It's gonna take time. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, today, if you talk about green hydrogen, it's a lot more expensive than even imported uh, liquefied gases. Yeah. Um, and so what we will do over the next two, three years, I think, is to do pilots for green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. But the costs are just going to be way too high. And uh, I think unless and until we have improvements in electrolyzer technologies, which brings the cost down. And in that respect, we just can't underestimate the Chinese because they do things at lightning speed. Yeah. So it very well be that electrolyzer costs happen, you know, reductions in costs happen faster than we expect. 
But at this point in time, it looks like it'll be at least, I would say seven years to 10 years before a hydrogen becomes a viable source. And that's primarily but electrolyzer. Think, Sorry, I interrupt. That's primarily because it costs electrolyzer or transportation uh, pipelines. Or so, so there are two, two, three issues. Obviously, one is the cost of the energy itself. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, renewables has become cheap. So to that extent, that uh, that addresses I one part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. But it will become cheaper as we go forward. So to that extent, that cost will go down. Mm -hmm. The second is the issue of gas pipelines for yeah. hydrogen. Uh, I don't think you can use the regular natural gas pipelines for green hydrogen. So you need new gas pipelines and new ways of transport transporting uh, the green hydrogen. So that I don't know how that's going to really be solved uh, at, a, at an industrial scale level. And the third issue, of course, is the electrolyzer cost itself. Yeah. And so I think we'll have to look at improvements in all three areas, uh, you know, uh, for green hydrogen to become a reality. Very good, very good. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And, and then the other big area, of course, is, is the growth of electric vehicles, just coming back to that. Because while wind and hydro, extraordinary success in India, as you said, the trajectory is very clear, it's, it's cost-based. Electric vehicles are still a little on the expensive side, but still, you know, challenging with uh, charge points and, 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 and range anxiety, things like this. But actually, I'm back to you and also your thoughts, Samant. Where's the inflection point in electric vehicles? Is it in buses and more other fleets? Or is it automobiles? And how do you see that, that part of the, the equation playing out? <laughs> yeah. So I would say if you talk about inflection point, it is near uh, for some segments, but a little far, you know, uh, someone talk about um, the green hydrogen being seven to eight uh, to 10 years away. Uh, for some segments like cars, HDVs, I would say it's still in the horizon, say five to 10 years, but there are already market ready segments. Uh, in, in the case of India, which is, you know, unlike rest of the world, it's two wheelers, three wheelers, and also buses where we are seeing cost parity already, but after government subsidies. I think that's something uh, critical uh, to note. Uh, because uh, there is still a sticker price shock for consumers uh, where there is an upfront differential. Subsidies for two wheelers, three wheelers are able to bring that down. Uh, there is total cost of ownership that is working in favor of EVs. But I think still uh, uh, there is that the confidence that the consumer need uh, in terms of you know, uh, the reliability of the technology. What we are seeing is... Uh, you know, more and more uh, confidence being shown by the businesses uh, in two wheelers and three wheeler segments. Uh, a very interesting trend that is happening uh, is, uh, you know, growth of startups uh, in EVs. And I think more than the big conventional OEMs, it's really these startups uh, which are driving the whole EV revolution right now in the India. And some of them are very big, some of them are huge. Just to give you a number, between 2012 and now, 450 EV startups have registered in the country and they've been able to raise about 8 million, uh, sorry, $800 million of investments from, you know, active investors. That, yeah. That's humongous in the whole ecosystem, just being brought for, you know, product design, setting up of manufacturing and provision of mobility services. What we're seeing is a lot of startups, a lot of services emerging in pure electric deliveries, uh, you know, B2B kind of, uh, uh, kind of commute services. So these are the segments where, you know, TCO parity is being achieved. There is a lot of support right now uh, from, from the, you know, government. Uh, so we're hoping say by 2023, 2024, as we see more production capacity, uh, these segments perhaps would not need subsidies, but the segments like cars and HTVs is something which I feel the inflection point is still away. Say we may have to wait till 2026, 27 uh, to reach there. And what could really help to probably, you know, advance that is uh, more push, more ZEV-like, uh, you know, you know, <laughs> mechanisms the way California has done. If that is done, that's put in place, perhaps we can, you know, change this timeline. But as of now, that's how the whole overall picture looks like. And you, uh, some of the incumbent uh, Indian automobile companies uh, starting to roll out electric models, or is that too early? You know, there's, there's yeah. quite a shocking announcement here last just last week. Uh, where General Motors, which is still the largest car company in the United States, uh, yeah. they're you know 100% electric by 2035, which is a little ways, but they'll you know, have 30 models quite soon. Yeah, um, that's quite a shock for you know big change. I mean, incumbents, yeah, yeah. So incumbents, uh, they have stayed away till they could. 
but mm-hmm. now some of the big players like tata motors are openly coming out and they're changing their strategy and they're committing to you know uh, reduce carbon or going carbon neutral uh, tata motors i think just recently at the world economic forum committed uh, to a transition they yeah. are coming up. so that's big development it was in the case a few months back where they were seen more as you know sitting in the position of uh, opposition to anything uh, that was moving in favor of evs now we are still you know working in that space we been <laughs> subjected to that opposition but uh, interestingly i think seeing the global trends uh, seeing a lot of development of the startup side i feel that i've gone to several places i've said that it's really the startups ev startups which have pushed the big oems to think that they are losing the first mover advantage uh, by not kind of you know bringing products uh, and already we seeing that in the two wheeler and three wheeler space yeah so now tesla tesla tesla's a startup too not so long ago and has rose most valuable yeah. I don't have a US dollar conversion by but one of the biggest startups uh, you know Ola Electric uh, they're like Uber we have Ola Ola Electric has raised uh, 2000 crores from the market to be you know going full time into manufacturing and setting up huge production facilities mm-hmm. for electric two wheelers and electric three wheelers and I think those are going to be some game changing uh they things started those sectors first yeah and this way up Yeah. I mean they're know where they're right now in terms of being an OEM and suddenly they'll set up a plant which is like I'm forgetting the numbers but huge production capacity for electric two wheelers and if you're getting that into the market I think that just turns out to be a game changer. Very good. And speaking of manufacturing Samant uh, on the solar side is there um and there uh, any chance for more solar production of panels or uh, balance of infrastructure in India? um in mean, much of the world solar is still being produced in china but um what are yeah. what are your thoughts on the manufacturing side and i know that's not your business but obviously you use the product yeah no no that's that's definitely going to happen uh, you know we can't have an industry that forever is dependent on chinese uh, imports uh, especially given uh, geopolitical issues and those kinds of sensitivities uh and, and you know we just be replacing one you know dependency on the middle east to a dependency Uh, of another kind for right. uh, energy to china which i think you know all said and done is not such a smart thing to do no. so i think the indian government is quite right in trying to encourage manufacturing in india and trying to come out with uh, you know some kind of duty structure and protection for uh, imports out of other countries um and um, eventually the intention is to manufacture solar panels in the country the government has come out of the production linked incentive scheme as well to be you know uh, uh, we are also looking at manufacturing in the country as well um more from a view to backward integrating our uh, our supply lines more than anything else yeah. it's not that we want to become a big uh, global uh, solar panel producer but the other thing that is also happening is that uh, you know i think globally solar is going to grow faster than people anticipate and uh, while of course the chinese will keep adding capacity uh, you know proactively um the reality is other countries will have the same kinds of issues that india has and they will look to diversify their supply chain and india can actually be a very good uh, source for that and our um, view is that uh, solar cell and and modern manufacturing in india will be maybe 10% higher than than what it is going to be in china maybe 10 to 15% oh. and so therefore it's not that it's that uncompetitive yeah and uh, if that is the case then india can actually be a good alternative provider of solar modules to the rest of the world yeah. uh, in, in in wind turbines for example we're already a big provider globally uh, yeah. and uh, you know people manufacture in india and export to other countries uh, and so therefore there is no reason why we can't do that in solar modules as well yeah. so and then eventually uh, that is going to translate to storage batteries as well now in batteries of course we are behind also um and uh, but again there is you know a, a production linked incentive that the government has announced with a view to encouraging more battery manufacturing as well uh, so let's see how that develops but certainly as in the government's intent on uh, trying to have more domestic manufacturing it's the right intent uh, and i think it's a natural logical extension of setting this massive 450 gigawatt target to yeah. do a lot of the manufacturing within the country itself So, if they did distribute generation, I think we'll see distribute manufacturing too. It's it's a natural uh, a natural flow. Yeah. So, switching topics again a little bit, I'm looking at some uh, audience questions. There's some very good questions. And there's a question about carbon credits. 
But more broadly, I just want to broaden the question to carbon pricing. Is there any any possibility of, of a carbon price in India? Some carbon markets, as the federal government to address climate change? Is that anything under discussion or is that unlikely uh, uh, in terms of setting a carbon price that would also further accelerate the, the growth in renewables or electric vehicles? And maybe actually, I'll end or some uh, if you have any thoughts on that. On a carbon price. Yeah, so look, I think carbon pricing is very important eventually because I think that's the only way in which we are going to be able to wean ourselves very broadly off carbon. Otherwise, there are many industries in India that don't think anything about emitting carbon into the atmosphere. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I think once there's proper measurement of that and a price that is put on it, then everybody will become more sensitive. Uh, it will make the end products more expensive. That will make certain industries less competitive as substitution products begin to kick in. And that is only what is going to focus a lot of people on their carbon emissions. Yeah. Otherwise, people don't care. You know, as Al Gore likes to say, we treat the atmosphere as an open sewer. Yeah. And we just keep dumping more and more carbon into it. Yeah. So I think we need a carbon price to focus people's minds on it. Now, in India, while we don't have an ostensible carbon price, we do have certain cesses on coal which is not the same thing, to be very honest with you, but at least coal is disincentivized to some extent. Right. But that's not, that's not the right solution. Yeah, it's one, one, one source, it's not, uh, it's not the right. right. Yeah, yeah. Actually, any thoughts on, on yeah. carbon pricing, carbon markets? Yeah, one quick point to add there, I think more from a transportation sector point of view, uh, there has been thankfully uh, a movement on cafe standards. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of, in terms of, you know, overall fleet or uh, stock efficiency and overall, you know, carbon uh, reduc intensity reduction of the vehicle fleet and stock. I think that's one positive development for some segments. We're already set very stringent, uh, you know, uh, CO2 standards and hopefully as we move forward, we will have it for the heavier segments as well. So not all vehicle segments are being covered by cafe standards. I think that's one positive development. There is in this space not so much of talk of, you know, uh, otherwise, you know, penalizing. Mm. Uh, uh, but what we're also seeing in some early seeds of ZEV schemes. I think that's one good thing, you know, one way of moving and how those are designed. Is that the state level or is that potentially federal? Uh, I would say that uh, more at a few states level, some progressive states uh, like Maharashtra are starting to think about that. They are revisiting their uh, two-year-old electric uh, vehicle policy, for example, right now. And they are thinking a little progressively and saying, okay, you know, if California could do it, why can't we, given that we are a hub for big uh, auto manufacturers. We're also like, say, the biggest market for uh, cars, uh, ICE cars in the country. So maybe we can do that beginning. So I think more and more, um, there is a movement on that side. And just one point that I want to highlight there is that, you know, particularly for EVs, there has been a lot of momentum, policy momentum. So much has been done by the government in terms of reforms. And there's huge amount of money on the table, uh, which is 1.4 billion US dollars for a three-year scheme to incentivize, just incentivize vehicles and charging infrastructure. And, but we've not seen an uptake. Mm. And or therefore, you know, be, uh, you know, some of the regulatory measures are becoming critical, like ZEV or mandating uh, certain, you know, fleet percentages to be electric, mandating manufacturers to sell a certain percent, uh, percentage of uh, vehicles, uh, EVs. So I think that's becoming more important because you're seeing that um, carrots are not working just alone. You need the sticks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so have to be a good balance of that as we move forward. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so just that, you know, I have to ask on the business side, I'm sure it's a topic you're tired of, but uh, COVID-19, uh, COVID how has it uh, affected business? And in India, in terms of coming out of this crisis, um, are, are there ongoing challenges you worry about or it's, you know, the path is pretty, pretty clear at this point? No, actually COVID has been a bit of a mixed uh, thing for us. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of things have happened. First of all, uh, I think the government has supported renewables pretty solidly during this time period. Uh, by a number of different factors. Number one, renewables in India under the Indian grid code has what is called must run status, yeah. which means that whatever power we produce has to be fed into the grid and absorbed by the grid. Um, now power demand in the lockdown fell by 25, 30%, uh, but renewables was not back down at all. So in some senses, it was a validation of that, of that rule. Um, and 
all the backing down happened in the context of the uh, coal based uh, uh, you know air power generation sources that's one the second thing that happened is that uh, the government also announced a a scheme to fund the distribution utilities which really was good because that allowed them to continue to be solvent and continue to pay us uh, so that is positive the third thing is that the government came out with a number of new auctions so they did not stop from their side on right. carrying on with new bids and new businesses and uh, again that was uh, that benefited us quite a bit so i think uh, from that standpoint it was good of course the reality is that we couldn't get uh, our people to carry on with the construction of our projects simply because we couldn't get people to our sites and equipment to our sites uh, but again the government was forthcoming in that they gave five month extensions blanket extensions to all projects that were getting constructed so we didn't get into uh, uh, commissioning date issues so so to that extent you know uh, i would say by and large uh, covid has been a i would say it's not been a, a negative thing for us if anything it's been um, positive to neutral uh, and um, so uh, so in that sense and i you know power demand has now come back to normal in mm-hmm. fact over the last few days we've had uh, record uh, peak uh, power demand in the country and so i think things are now more or less where they were had covid not occurred very good very good and from a construction perspective you're back uh, everything's okay on the yeah now construction has started all over again you know we in the middle we had a big you know significant hiatus because as i said we couldn't get people to sites and also equipment factories and all had shut down yeah. but all of that has now been addressed and uh, we are now back to back to normal very good very good and i guess sort of a broader broader issue brush Brought a challenge beyond COVID, of course, the challenge of climate change. And uh, when I was in India two years ago in March, it was uh, two or three years ago. It was it was extraordinarily hot, unbelievably hot. And um, not just from my perspective, but even even for India, it was very hot. Um, how is public support and political support for addressing climate change at the moment? Is that um, is there is there increasing support? Is is the reality of of increasing heat and and the challenge that comes with that or is it still you know people are aware but it's not not high on the list of concerns given all the other all the other challenges we have to live with um what's 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 the trend at the moment there and as <laughs> matter actually either one of you maybe, maybe I actually the first, first. Thoughts, I, first. i would say my my take is my understanding is that uh, the increasing awareness is more on air pollution and not so much on climate change you're you know, particular it's not um, yeah so it's really about pollution in cities that's okay. driving and pushing government for some action just to give you an example uh, delhi came out with uh, an electric vehicle policy and it was really in the context of pollution nothing to contribute really towards climate change yeah. uh, you know even um, even government's own fame schemes etc while you know they would definitely estimate you know how much of the reduced carbon etc it's really about you know the, the the key drivers are energy security industrial competitiveness and air pollution yeah. so i would say that here at least i feel um, climate change right now uh, uh, is more of a co benefit the co2 reductions are more of a co benefit air pollution is more of a driver but having said that i think media has been doing a good job in terms of creating that awareness there is more and more reporting there is more and more more kind of you know awareness building so i think to some extent i'm sure in urban areas there is an increased awareness around that yeah yeah but not enough to put enough you know pressure or create public pressure yeah yeah interesting so what any any thoughts on uh... yeah no i would i would tend to agree with that i think that in india you know climate change is recognized as being an issue but i don't think that india feels a special obligation in general at the societal level yeah. uh, to do much about it at the governmental level fortunately there is a significant uh, recognition that we have to do a bit to solve climate change and, and address it but i think where there is a lot of uh, societal uh, support really is in the area of air pollution and you know a lot of cities in india suffer from very very bad uh, air pollution right now i yeah. mean delhi the city that i live in is just uh, abysmal it's yeah. it's intolerable actually and it's not just caused by stubble burning in in the october november december months even in january i have seen that uh, uh, the air quality index stays pretty bad so it's it's really just the fact that you know air movement slows down and therefore all these things that keep getting emitted from whether it's construction or 
car, uh, you know, exhausts or anything else, it just it sticks. It just doesn't move. Yeah. So all of these emissions just have to come down. So there is an air pollution uh, recognition, but not a climate change recognition. And certainly at the state level, neither of those things is well recognized, to be very honest. Yeah. It's not really a big, big consideration. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. But fortunately, there's co-benefits. So, you know, you solve one, you can solve the other two at the same time. It's a good thing. We just have a few minutes left, and I just want to sort of ask one question. Um, I think most of the most of the audience are, are business school students, uh, recent graduates, and policy SIPA students and graduates. And so, uh, you know, there's a career focus, I think. And, um, you know, any sort of uh, advice on, on career opportunities, where you would see growth if you were just graduating now and, and I, I wish I wish I was <laughs> um, where you know what you would be thinking about and the opportunities you would be pursuing in, in, in these sectors that we've been discussing maybe actually my first from your your perspective you know, so much. I have always been in a think tank world I used to be with Terry for a very long time and now with RMI so I feel <laughs> Um, definitely the climate funding, the philanthropic funding, you know, funding from multilaterals is being, um, has sustained and has grown, at least in this ecosystem. And we do see, you know, very good organizations and very good work happening. I'm just talking about India and my, you know, awareness of this ecosystem. Um, so definitely there is a need for very, very high quality leaders, managers, thought leaders who can drive and support, uh, you know, policy changes. Um, you know, our, you know, I'm just taking our example. I think one thing that we realized working with close partners like Niti Aayog and some of the state governments is that there is a lot of receptiveness for advanced thinking, progressive thinking. So it's no more like, you know, 10 years back where you were to really respond to policymakers' wishes and saying, okay, you know, how things have been, just give us policy solutions. I think now it's it has become very exciting to be working in policy space, in a think tank space. So definitely, you know, people who have interest in that kind of, and this kind of work excites them, there, there are very good opportunities. Second, I feel is, you know, again, I'm reiterating the whole startup ecosystem. I think that's where there is a lot of freedom, a lot of innovation uh, that is happening. There is a lot of support from VCs that we are seeing. So I think this ecosystem is also interesting for new business leaders. Yeah. Very dynamic, a lot going on really. Yeah, very stage is fantastic. Samant, so what, what are your thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, look, I, I think that uh, the whole area of uh, energy transition and clean tech is a massive, massive, massive opportunity right now. Um, you know, it's a new sector almost. We're still at the infancy of this sector. Mm -hmm. It's a multi-decadal uh, growth area. Uh, th think about it this way. Um, you know, today renewable energy is about a thousand gigawatts installed capacity in the world. The expectation is that in the next 20 to 30 years, it'll be 15 times of that. Now, that's not going to happen by itself. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen only with a lot of hard effort, a lot of people getting in, a lot of capital going in. So there are going to be opportunities in all the different areas, from investing to being an operator to being a clean tech company that provides, for example, services uh, you know, to, to this whole humongous sector that is going to evolve. And the other way to think about it is that, look, the power sector has been created over 100 years, right? We are now going to replicate something. And by the way, today, the installed capacity of power globally is 6,000 gigawatts. So we're going to add three to four times of that just in renewable energy in the next 30 to 40 years at max. What it has taken us, 6,000 gigawatts in the last 100 years. Right. So just think about that. The kind of investment required in this sector is going to be going forward more than what has been going into the electricity sector as well as the oil and gas sector. Both put together is now going to equal renewable energy going forward. So this is going to be a massive opportunity for anybody, any young person who wants to um, craft a career for themselves over a long-term time period. Uh, as I said, investing, operating, ancillary services. There's going to be a tremendous, tremendous number of very, very large scale, large size opportunities. And we are just at the infancy of this market. So there are there, there it has a lot of legs to, to go. Yeah, that's great advice. I couldn't agree more. I think uh, this this massive disruption is uh, not so good for people of my generation and very good for people of uh, the next generation, right? Disruption creates opportunity. That's true. It's fantastic. That is true. Fantastic. 
Um, I see Aman has, has, has uh, switched his camera on here. So I think it's time for us to wrap up. Um, from New York, I just want to thank uh, both of you very much. Actually, Aman and Aman, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, really, uh, I've enjoyed the conversation a great deal. I hope we, uh, hope some other time we actually get to do this in person. <laughs> Uh, Aman, over to you. Oh, I think you're on mute, Aman. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Asher. Thank you, Mr. Sena, for your time. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Gatti. Uh, so it was an extremely holistic discussion from, from generation of clean energy to application uh, in e-mobility to battery storage, which is extremely close to me, my, uh, my heart, uh, and uh, government policies. Uh, 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 while I was wearing the, the, the policy hat at back at Niti IO when I was there, uh, I remember it's very difficult. Uh, so the challenge is always on carrot and stick. While in a, in a country like India, uh, which is a federal democratic system, sticks are extremely difficult. So it's always goes by the carrot. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had announced a lot of policies around the stick, RPOs, renewable purchase obligation, uh, uh, fixed percentage for OEMs to produce uh, electric mobilities, but with the lobbies, with the state governments, it's extremely difficult. So it always goes with the carrot in India. That's that's the basic essence of the challenges. And uh, uh, so, without taking much of time, uh, I call upon uh, my my colleague to uh, for the next session, which is on leaders and founders building and sustaining uh, ventures through COVID nineteen. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thanks. 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 Thanks.